The most talked about decentralist movement in the world also comprises one of the most successful anarchist military ventures in history. And did I mention this venture was also against ISIS and other jihadists? This is Byron with Springtime of Nations, and today we'll be covering Rojava. You may not have heard of the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, or even its more common name Rojava, but if you've watched even mainstream news for the last eight years or so, you've probably heard of the fighters of Syrian Kurdistan. This ethno-region has had de facto autonomy since 2013, created out of the rubble of the Syrian civil war. But who are the Kurds, who have had numerous movements for autonomy in many other countries, such as Iraq, Turkey, and Iran? We'll attempt to answer this question by looking first at the history of their struggle. The Kurds are an ironic ethno-linguistic group, who had several small kingdoms during the Middle Ages, and even led a short-lived Grand Islamic Caliphate under Saladin and his heirs. But they were divided between the Ottoman and Persian empires during the 16th century. Kurdish nationalism was kindled in the 19th century, with Sheikh Ubaidallah leading an uprising together with Nestorian Christians against the Ottomans and Persians in 1880. In his words, My dear sons, we must obey the advice of our fathers and grandfathers. Enough is enough. We must not bear the burden of the tyranny of the infidel Turks. We need to save ourselves, not only the Kurds from Ottoman Turkey, but also our Kurdish brothers in Iran from these two governments that have blocked the path of progress for us. Our ancestors asked us to donate our blood through the religion of freedom. Both empires crushed the rebellion by 1882, but Kurdish nationalism would continue to percolate, especially within the borders of the Ottoman Empire. In 1908, Sheikh Ubaidallah's son, Abdul Qadir Ubaidallah, helped found the Kurdish Society for Cooperation and Progress, which was a liberal nationalist secret movement the first of its kind for the Kurds. The Ottomans suppressed this organization, but Ubaidullah founded another during the First World War along the same lines, the Society for the Advancement of Kurdistan. During the war, many Kurds served the Ottoman Empire loyally, including the most gruesome aspects involving the genocide of Christian minorities like Armenians and Assyrians, but many others resisted the Turks militarily, resulting in genocide and mass deportation of the Kurds themselves. The collapse of the empire and its partition into the League of Nations mandates gave Kurds hope for a Kurdish nation-state, something the British promised them in the Treaty of Sevres in 1920. Ultimately, the new Republic of Turkey asserted itself in the War of Independence against the Allied powers, and by 1923, the dream of Kurdistan had vanished, and Kurds continued to live in Middle Eastern countries as a disenfranchised minority. In the French Mandate of Syria, many Kurds fleeing the new state of Turkey after the 1925 and 1927 Kurdish uprisings, the first of which ended in Abdul Ubaidullah's execution, found a new home in the western part of the country, with Kurds who had been living there for centuries. When Syria gained independence after World War II, it identified as an Arab country. In the 1963 coup by the Arab nationalist Ba'athist party, this led to repressive measures against all non-Arab ethnicities, but particularly Kurds, with Kurdish being banned in schools and even in public use at the workplace or during marriage ceremonies. In 1992, Kurdish names were not even allowed to be given to children. Kurdish land was systematically seized and given to Arabs, and many, many other forms of oppression, both large and small, were inflicted on the Kurds. Most of this was enacted by current president Bashar al-Assad's father, Hafez, who took power in a second coup in 1970 and ran Syria until his death in 2000. The Arab Spring and ensuing Syrian civil war in 2011 gave Kurdish nationalists under the Kurdish Suprema Committee an opportunity to seize autonomy from Syria and they formed the People's Protection Units, a paramilitary organization known as the YPG. In order to understand the YPG's ideology and its relationship to anarchism, one first has to understand its connection to another group, the PKK. In 1970s Turkey, similar to Syria, state persecution of the Kurdish minority was at an all-time high. 
Kurdish traditional dress, Kurdish cultural practices, and eventually even the Kurdish language and names were banned. In response to this, a clique of leftist Kurdish nationalists formed around a charismatic leader named Abdullah Ashalan. The group soon coalesced into a political party called the Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK. The party's official ideology was Marxist-Leninism. The PKK engaged in violent street fights with Turkish nationalists during the political violence that led to the 1980 Turkish coup. After the coup, the party was driven underground and many of its members fled to Syria, where they were given refuge by Hafez al-Assad in an effort to undermine Turkey. From there, they became an outright paramilitary group and began a campaign of guerrilla warfare against the Turkish state. This conflict escalated until the 1990s, when Ashalan was captured and sentenced to death. Although as Turkey tried to join the European Union, they commuted this sentence to life in prison. Ashalan remains imprisoned in Turkey to this day. While in prison, Ashalan's ideology began to shift away from Marxist-Leninism. Eventually, influenced by anarchist thinkers like Murray Bookchin, Ashalan and the PKK dropped Marxism entirely and began espousing what they call democratic confederalism. By the time of the Syrian civil war, the PKK had a large presence in Syria and became a founding core or vanguard of the YPG, bringing their ideology with them. As Kurdish fighter Zind Ruken explained in an interview with the Wall Street Journal, Sometimes I'm PKK, sometimes I'm YPG. It doesn't really matter. They're all members of the PKK. Now, if you've watched the last video on this channel, you know that we at Springtime of Nations are not the biggest fans of democracy. But we also are not ones to get hung up on words. Most of the problems with democracy as it exists in the modern nation state is tyranny of the majority whereby individual rights can be swept aside in these massive elections, which are decided largely by demographic tribalism. While it's by no means perfect, the PKK, and by extension Rojava, mitigates that problem substantially by the liberal application of the confederalism part of their ideology. Essentially, the core of their idea is decentralization to the greatest extent possible. Political decisions in Rojava are usually made at the town or community level, with the integration of pre-existing ethnic and local customs into the political system. The central government, if it can be called that, exists primarily for the purpose of coordinating defense. Despite being a favorite of Western anarcho-communists, the economic arrangement of Rojava is far from communism. Its constitution guarantees the right to private property, and the only tax levied is a small tariff to support the military activities of the YPG, which, remember, is not engaged in some distant war to build an empire, but instead is defending itself against the Turkish army actively invading them. The YPG still is not mainly funded by this tax, but by a monopoly on the sale of oil, which it has seized from ISIS and other jihadist groups. While the democratic confederalist movement of northeast Syria has its roots in Kurdish nationalism, it has grown to transcend these roots by inviting various other ethno-religious groups of the region into the confederation. The YPG now acts as a vanguard of a larger multi-ethnic military force, consisting of Assyrians, Turkmen, Armenians, and of course, Arabs. This military coalition has become known as the Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF. Non-Kurds make up somewhere from 20 to 40 percent of SDF fighters. There is of course some tension, and even accusations of ethnic cleansing, but not nearly as much as you might think. This is because of the decentralist nature of Rojava, which allows local communities to basically do their own thing so long as they accept the premises of the confederation. This system of an ethno-religiously diverse confederation united by shared ideology and focused on self-defense is reminiscent of the revolutionary era American Republic, and even more so of the early Swiss Confederation. For most of the Syrian civil war, the U.S. had been focused on undermining the Assad regime, which is opposed to Israel and allied with Russia, by any means possible, including by the support of Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups. This famously led to cases of the U.S. indirectly aiding the rise of ISIS, as the so-called moderate rebels they helped to arm ended up pledging allegiance to the Islamic State. However, 
When it became clear that the Assad regime would not fall without an outright invasion, the U.S. largely switched to supporting the SDF, which, ironically, is now in an uneasy alliance with the Syrian regime. Seeing this, the increasingly authoritarian Turkey reacted by launching a full-scale invasion of Syria, eager to ensure that the PKK-affiliated Rojava should not establish a foothold adjacent to them. So the current situation is that ISIS and the Saudi-backed Islamist militias are all but defeated, and Rojava and the Assad regime are now fighting side by side against the Turkish army and its affiliated Islamist militias. Meanwhile, the U.S. continues to support Rojava while condemning the Assad regime and trying its best to make up with Turkey. What a mess. So, how should libertarians react to this situation? Well, firstly, we should continue to advocate a principled non-interventionist foreign policy on the part of the state. However, we should make the important distinction between the state and ourselves as a political movement. The state doesn't really care what happens to the people of Syria, except insofar as it relates to the ongoing geopolitical struggle with other states like Russia. In fact, given Rojava's reconciliation with the Syrian regime and Turkey's status as a NATO member, it seems unlikely that the Confederation can rely on American support much longer. But they should be able to rely on support from American libertarians. In Rojava, libertarians are presented not only with a successful, but a sympathetic candidate for support. The social and political views of the YPG are much closer to that of the libertarian than many liberal democracies in the West. It's not clear how the situation will ultimately resolve itself, and if the Syrian regime chooses to repeal some of its Arabization laws, the Kurds could end up staying nominally a part of Syria. But Rojava as it exists now is a great boon to champions of liberty who want to show how a free society can emerge, even from the bloody chaos of a civil war. Do you agree with this analysis? Let us know why or why not in the comments below. Remember to like and subscribe for some more similar content. Our next video in this series will tackle the occupation of East Turkestan by the People's Republic of China. Thank you for watching, and may a thousand flowers bloom.